I'm here with Greg Musselman. He is Vice President for Domestic Ministries and Media for Voice of the Martyrs Canada, and he's a passionate advocate for Christians all over the world who are facing torture and even death for their faith. Greg, welcome. Good to be back with you, Cheryl. I'm excited to talk about our topic today because I think it will be surprising to most people, which is the country of Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Persecution is happening in Sri Lanka? Yeah, I mean, when uh, and that's the one that always kind of pops out at people. Sri Lanka, that's a Buddhist country. Buddhists are, pa you know, passive people. Yeah. You know, it's not like ISIS, you know, in Iraq or Boko Haram, you know, Nigeria, or some of the things that we've seen when we were together in India with the, you know, more militant Hindus. But yeah, it's happening, uh, you know, at a great, it, in fact, it's increasing. Uh, you know, there's more than 100 incidents of churches being burned, pastors, uh, you know, being injured, some cases killed, uh, you know, and it seems to be increasing. And it's something that was not understood because, again, we think of Sri Lanka. This is beautiful country. Uh, you know, it's got some of the best beaches in the world, and it's a tourist destination, and and a, and a lot of you know Buddhist uh, holy sites, lots of tourism. But yeah, there's a lot of persecution going on. So what's driving this? Because honestly, it's true. Like when you think of Buddhists the world over, you think of some of the most peaceful, mm -hmm. peace-loving people, the Dalai Lama. You know, what's driving Buddhists to become so violent? Well, I think when people see the, you know, the video of Buddhist monks, uh, you know, ripping down, you know, signs off churches and, you know, beating people and causing all sorts of uh, destruction, they, they are surprised. But I think it's like anything, and, and, and unfortunately there is some even within Christendom, you know, persecution against evangelicals in countries like Ethiopia or Chiapas and other states down in Mexico. When people start to leave one religion, the primary religion of a country, you know, that usually happens, and they become especially evangelical Christians, which are often seen as American or Western for sure, but mostly American, they see that as, you know, causing problems within their culture. At least that's how they say it. It's going to wreck Sri Lanka. You know, this is a Buddhist country. We don't want this foreign religion in there. And so as a result of those that go in, plant churches, and most of the persecution takes place in rural areas. Now, in the main city of Colombo is an example, uh, where I you know, attended some church services and talked to the pastors there. Their issues are things like permits, and they you know, just kind of run interference, and then there's these court cases, and these uh, you know, unethical conversions, and all these kinds of Harassment things. Kind Harassment, of yeah. But where it gets really dangerous is in the rural areas, and I know we're gonna show a clip in a moment of a pastor there that uh, you know, was planted a church, and actually had favor from the local community. But when people started to come to know the Lord, the religious leaders, then they start getting angry. And then as a result of that, they attack the churches. And Godfrey Yoga Raja, who heads the organization that we work with uh, down in Sri Lanka, heading up uh, the, the evangelical community there, uh, says that, you know, as long as the Christians don't do evangelism, stay inside your walls, no problems. But there's some of these evangelicals Spirit-filled folks that say, no, we want to go to villages and we want to preach the gospel because people need to know about Jesus Christ. That's their motive. That's their, their desire. They go in, they start preaching. People come to know the Lord. And uh, they're they, the then they're, they're threatening the status quo, and then you see all sorts of problems for them. Well, you mentioned this pastor, AK, and mm. uh, his story. You know, sometimes it's good just to see, I think, the, the story itself of one individual to understand the impact and, and really the pain that these people feel when their community turns against them. So let's take a look. Pastor A.K., along with over 30 believers, were praying during a Sunday morning service when a mob of about 25 people from the village, led by three Buddhist monks, barged into the church service. When the Buddhist monks and the mob came inside the church, they started using bad language and said, this is a Buddhist country and we can't let you have a church inside a Buddhist village and you have to leave. They also were scolding my wife. I couldn't help my husband because I went out to get my second son and he cried out and said, Mother, please don't let them hurt my father. I took him out. The oldest son was with one of the believers and the youngest one was sleeping and the mob was breaking all the windows, so I went and got him out of the house. After the mob chased the Christians out of the church building, Pastor A.K. tried to reason with the Buddhist monks. Realizing he wasn't getting anywhere, he knelt down by the pulpit. I started to pray and said, God, please take this situation into your hands because only you can do something. While I was praying, I felt something big hit me in the head. I didn't know what it was and I fell down and went unconscious for a few seconds. AK learned that he'd been hit over the head with a guitar. When he opened his eyes, he saw the mob destroying the sound equipment and assaulting the person playing the organ. 
four people in the mob began to beat the pastor. They assaulted me on my stomach and my back and to my head. I kept my hands over my head, trying to protect my head. My whole body was shaking. The attack on the church lasted only a few minutes. But in that time, the sound equipment, instruments and furniture were all destroyed. After the police left, the believers took me to the hospital. I have very severe back pain and I get headaches on and off. The only thing I can do is to pray about it. Even though AK and the others at the church could identify those who attacked them, there were no arrests. So, Greg, you can see the pain on their faces and the hurt and the fear even that they're feeling. And the story doesn't end there, does it? No. And, uh, you know, the thing that really, when I was talking, uh, you know, with this pastor, AK, and we had a little bit of time, you know, together and to pray. And he clearly, uh, you know, had a head injury, probably a concussion, but a lot of fear, too, that, uh, that you know, had entered his, his heart. I mean... He almost lost his family. They were almost killed. Uh, I found with his wife, actually, she was uh, the stronger one, you know, in terms of her, I don't want to say her faith was stronger, but certainly she had a more of a determination and didn't seem to be as affected by it. And he's a very soft-spoken guy, very nice guy. And, you know, your, your heart just bleeds for these people. All they want to do is proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And ministry is hard enough. And I've yeah. pastored, and I, you know, that's, that's not an easy thing. i got many pastor friends as you do in Canada. It's not easy. But you add the dynamic where you're afraid that you're going to be killed. And I mean, these people have told them, like, you know, we burned, we burned down your church or tried to burn down your church, which was attached to the home, as we know. And they say they're going to come back and they probably will. And so you're, you're living under that constant fear. Now, it's easy to say, well, you need to pray and you need to, you know, whatever. Yeah, you do. But on the other hand, there's also the reality, as a father, I'm responsible for my children. Now, my kids are a little older now, yeah. but, uh, you know, these are toddlers, and, you know, he needs to provide for them, and he needs to keep them safe. And you and I have talked about this many times, because, you know, like, you have to face the fact that you could be killed, because you're going into very restricted countries. Uh, as, a, as a Westerner, as a Christian, you could be kidnapped or murdered at any time. So you kind of count the cost of that, but when you bring your family into the mix, that is an entirely different thing. Well, I, I can tell you, Cheryl, and I think you've met my daughter, Sarah, uh, when she was in South Sudan, and I've been in South Sudan a few times, and as it turned out, the person she was supposed to go with had to come back to Canada to do some immigration things, so she went to South Sudan by herself. My wife was not happy with me. Um, <laughs> now, and my wife is a woman of faith. She's got, she way, she's got way more faith than I do, and, and a godly woman. But I'm thinking Sarah's in this Tuchel, you know, uh, grass hut down in South Sudan. You know, she's been in the jungles of Colombia when they made a movie down there. Uh, so that's one thing if I go. It's another thing if my kids go. Uh, you know, and I, you know, constantly, of course, praying. And it's amazing how your prayer life increases when it's your daughter, <laughs> this yeah. blonde, you know, beautiful girl. And, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, like, so, so there's a part of that. But then, yeah, there's, there's also the family part of it. And I know Arlene and I have had these discussions. In fact, she's going to be, uh, you know, teaching at a conference uh, about that whole thing of do we really as parents let our children go? So, yeah, we count the cost for ourselves and for our families. And so then we can understand better when you look at it as a dad, the situation for AK. They did actually try to burn down the church after that. Yes, and he's they did. still in jeopardy. What do you say to people like that? That doesn't sound trite or shallow or, you know, trust God. Well, you know what? I, I, I would never give advice, you know, in terms of staying or going. In fact, uh, when we're talking about what was happening in Iraq and some of the pastors, you know, saying, no, please don't leave. You need to stay. I don't think we have the right to do that. And I've talked to some pastors and said, you know, we do have to be very careful. Do we want Christians to stay there? You know, in, is, whether it's, uh, you know, Pastor AK in, in Sri Lanka in, in his village or the, or the Christians in places like Syria and Iraq and Iran, wherever, it's dangerous. That's their call. I would encourage them, you know, not to have fear, to pray for them, to seek the Holy Spirit. And if they feel they need to leave, they have to do what's, what they feel is right for them. Yeah, and you know, part of this I think that we miss here in the West is sometimes persecution, the church overseas recognizes that it does something for their faith because you really have to count the cost. You have to decide, mm -hmm. is this something worth dying for? How, how serious am I about my faith? And then to fight the fear and the danger, you have to actually really press into your faith in a sense, press into God and, and get a depth to your faith. Do you see that? 
Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, because I'm, I'm a North American, I'm a Canadian, Western Canadian Christian. That's, you know, and, you know, my church experience. And, and I know the, the challenges living in a, you know, materialistic, secular society. I have a good friend, uh, name's Tesfai, and he worked with us in uh, Ethiopia for many years. He now lives in Canada. And I remember, say, and I quote him often when I'm speaking in meetings or doing these kinds of things, is he said to us in our living room, Darlene and I, I said, if you can be a Christian in Canada, and that Christian meaning follow of Jesus Christ, passionate for Him. If you can really be a Christian in, uh, you know, in Canada, you know, then you're, you know, doing well. And it is the most, he said, the most difficult place to be a Christian anywhere in the world because of all the things around us. I mean, if you're in a country where there's persecution going on, you're either in or out. And what would happen to our North American church if we got into a situation where persecution really became uh, hard and, and people had to make a decision? I've often thought you can't be glib about that. Nobody really knows what's going to happen in that moment when you have to choose between life and death and your faith or conversion to another religion. But, you know, we pray that we all would stay strong and that we'd make those right choices. Greg, thank you so much for being a voice for the persecuted church. Well, thank you, Cheryl. I appreciate the part that you play to get it known to Canadians and people around the world. We always love having you here. And if you're watching this and your heart's been moved for Christians around the world, please take a moment today to pray for them. And not just today, but in the days and weeks ahead, keep the rest of our brothers and sisters around the world in prayer. It's important. They need you to remember them. It means the world to them. Thank you so much.